hope isn't the name of the Lord who made heaven this in our life. Man, I think maybe we could, uh, since we didn't, didn't have a time of prayer together, we can sing the hymn which is calling the Holy Spirit for us. It's a time uh, we expect the, uh, and the gifts, the holy gifts of the Spirit. Veni Creator Spiritus, mentes Tuorum visitam, in presu pena gratia, que tu creasti pectora, vidicerius this right to life. And tomorrow will open until the mystic horizon of human life. So today it's with spirituality really the core of this possible opening of human life's horizon towards God. I think spirituality starts when you are able to recognize that in human life, in a human being, there is more than just human. There is divine in us. There is a statement of the French philosopher uh, Blaise Pascal, well known, who told that the human surpasses the human. And everybody would agree with us, but in the today's society, the consequences uh, are not admitted as an evidence. 
to consider as a human life as a gift, a gift of God, which is very much contested uh, by ideological science especially, and to consider human life as a task, as a vocation. We have to achieve our humanity in answering to a call to become human. So spirituality is a journey, opens a journey. And my contribution is in a very limited way to show how faith, Christian faith, naturally or by itself gives birth to a spirituality centered on love and flourishing in dialogue. I try to follow the five points <laughs> proposed or imposed by <laughs> Abbot Timothy. <laughs> the sources of faith, then the relationship between faith and reason, the spirituality of faith, expression of faith in a spiritual life, and finally the role of dialogue. There is a very general meaning of faith, which is trust and in uh, modern thinking, it's rather a negative uh, expression because it's a limitation of knowledge. And even here in this experience that everybody do live in society, you have to trust, you have to rely on others, on others' knowledge, on others' capability. We all have faith in by coming in that the pilot of the plane was able to conduct the plane. But when we speak about faith, religious faith, we speak about a very original act which is combining human and divine, individuality and community, love and intellect or reason. The first point is that God is not imposing to us a kind of overwhelming presence. We don't, I don't meet God as I meet you or I have relation with things. And therefore, St. Paul says that faith comes from what is heard, what is heard. Even in Christian religion, where we say that the word of God appeared, has been touched, seen by man, we receive this word of God through the voice of testimonies, of testimonies. And speaking of sources of faith as a plural, it's already a confession that we are not able to receive, as it is, the oneness of God. The source, the unique source, it's also one of the beautiful names, uh, most beautiful names of God. Our access is through this pearl of mercy. Creation is the first source of the revelation of God. It's the book fall full of the signs of God. It was an expression dear to the Middle Ages. But a human being is quite busy with his uh, trade and stuff and, uh, and satisfied, easily satisfied with uh, the pleasure he takes in relationship to things. And he's very slow to open to God's revelation in these signs. And therefore, therefore, there is this pedagogy, divine pedagogy, and we receive in the main source for a Christian, which is the Bible, the Holy Bible, God's Word, God's Word, a word that is opening history, a word of alliance with Abraham, the first pilgrim of faith, and many prophets, a word of a promise, a word that is also announcing a fulfillment which is
beyond our experience of the world. And finally, Christian recognize the voice of God, the word of God in a person, Jesus Christ. And therefore, we are a little bit reluctant uh, to be assimilated as people of the book, because it's not the book, it's the fulfillment of the book in a person, Jesus Christ, which is for, for us the truthful witness of the source, of the divine source. And regarding at the scale of history, Jesus is nothing. I mean, he's a, a prophet in a remote country, he had very little success in his preaching. Yes, he did some miracles, but he was quick eliminated because his witness to the boundless mercy of God was also an implicit uh, claim to be deeply united with God. And his death manifested the source that was in him. And for us, to the Jewish Bible, Christian faith added all these testimonies of the disciples that encountered Jesus in a glorified state after his death on the cross. All the sources with this pearl, the church developed many texts, confessions of faith, dogmas, uh, catechism, you have a good translation in, in Persian also. Uh, these sources are to give way to this experience of Jesus that open a new way to live without fear of death and freed from, from sin. Faith is therefore not a matter of documents, but it's a matter of relation. Relation to God, and faith is the obedient ascent of the whole person to the God revealed in Jesus Christ. And in the church, the believer lives a mediated encounter with God. And it's also through the sacraments, you know, which are signs of the grace of God, uh, through also the, the, the deeds of mercy, practice of sharing, etc. The second point is the relation between faith and reason. God is light. God is a source of all light and he created human beings as capable of him, as capable of his light, capable to receive the logos. We spoke yesterday about God created man in, in his image. And that's the reason why, at the beginning, the first centuries of the church, uh, the Christians were often referred as the true philosophy. The true philosophy. The revelation meets the quest, the human quest towards ultimate meaning of life, quests also of happiness. And reading, uh, to prepare this paper, the presentation of Dr. Shomali, uh, of uh, the presentation of Shia face, I was impressed by the trust and the confidence in reason. And I think we, we share most of this trust. Because reason and revolution do come from the unique source. And there can be no opposition between the two. Uh, the recent popes, uh, John Paul II and Benedict XVI, said, 
emphasize quite a lot this coherency between faith and revelation. Pope John Paul II had this beautiful image that faith and reason are the two wings, the two wings on which the human spirit rises to the contemplation of truth. Still, if human intelligence is capable to recognize God in creatures, quite often a human being don't achieve this discovery of God. And therefore comes revelation. Faith conjugates freedom, uh, an act of free will, and intelligence, and intelligence, the two, the two, and rooted at a deep existential level, which in biblical tradition we call the heart, the heart. And we can say that intellect and love cooperate, or as Gregory the, the, Gregory the Great is a, bio, a, a pope of the 7th century, the biographer of Saint Benedict, he told that love is in itself knowledge. That's why we can find very simple believers, very simple people with little uh, intellectual skills able to understand God much better than uh, big theologians with uh, very skilled uh, reasoning uh, tools. Faith is a matter of relation. And the more you love, the more you enter into the understanding. You, the more you open to the light of God, his revelation, the more you are transformed in him. I note for the general topic of the human dignity that reason is for us a common ground to meet in the society, in a pluralistic society, to meet with non-believers but also with other believers. And also the paramount, which is freedom in this act of faith. There is no way to force someone to believe. It's like a jump of trust, an act of freedom. The third point, the spirituality of faith. I started with some etymology. In the biblical culture, the spirit has a broad meaning, starting with a concrete, very concrete meaning. The, the spirit is, first of all, the wind. Then it's also the, the breath, the breath insufflated into all living beings. And more specifically, the soul or the human principle of life insufflated by God. And ultimately, the spirit is also the divine spirit itself, which is God's inner mystery, his indwelling presence in creature. So talking about the spirituality of faith, it's saying that we are talking about a faith which is breathing, which is breathing. The contrary would be a dogmatic faith, a prisoner of formulas. We start to receive the sources of faith like elements exterior to us. And all the journey of spirituality of faith will be to internalize and let this Sources of faith transform us. And this is the work of the Holy Spirit. 
there is, at the deep heart of any human being, this point, which is the conscience, conscience. And the Council of Vatican II talked about conscience as the place where God speaks directly to human beings. Spiritual, the spirituality of faith in all, is all about this dialogue, an asymmetrical dialogue, but that really unites divine and human. God alone can communicate God, but the human labor, the human path, is to consent. And therefore, we speak about the obedience, obedience of faith, an obedient listening of the revelation of God. It's the same word, obedience and listening, in Latin or in Greek, and if you try to translate into Arabic, I think we would say it is Islam, and this existential attitude to consent to God. And so among, among how many notes of this obedience, I just mentioned humility, which is an answer to God's humility that reveals himself in very humble, humble sources, humble medi mediations. Humility is a journey of self-knowledge in which we are purified from our idolatry. In all believers there is uh, an idolatry uh, person. person. Uh, it's a little bit provocative, but I think, you, yeah, <laughs> along the journey, the <laughs> idols have to crawl down to, to be free, because idols are just a projection of human intellect, of human uh, desire that acts as a mirror and impeach the access to God. You need this humility, you may need this purification of the heart. Finally, in Christian faith, the journey is in Jesus himself, and it is through him, in his spirit, that we become capable of realizing human highest possibility, which is to love as God himself, himself loves. <clears throat> the fourth point, expre ex uh, expressing a face in a spiritual life, expressing face in a spiritual life. There is, in this journey, a tension between particular and universal. In any human life, you receive your life in a particular environment. I'm not from nowhere, I'm French, I'm from a Christian family, I'm male, and etc. And all this is kind of limitation, limitations. But we have this capability to open all particularity towards universal. And intelligence and love are the both opening to universal. And this is the path, the journey of spiritual journey to reach out towards the absolute. But we cannot eliminate what is particular. Faith requires a particular environment to grow a particular access to sources and continue to express itself in particular ways. But opening itself more and more and starting as a closed self, it 
<coughs> gives birth to a we. And face is a, not a singular act, it's a personal act in communion with others. When I say I believe, I say it in the communion of all believers. Perhaps monks are responsible for a misrepresentation of the spiritual life. For many people, spiritual life is just like a, an island somewhere, or a bubble, preserved from all the uh, normal life, I would say. And, but spiritual life is, as it says, it's life, the whole of life, but energized, transformed, unified by the Spirit, the Divine Spirit. And we can say that nothing human, even humble realities of life, is unworthy to participate to this spiritual life, this fullness of life, what St. Paul calls the logical cult, logique latreia. Monasticism is a very particular way to live the consent to God's revelation, communication of himself with some radical choices to live celibacy, but in a community, to live a relative withdrawal from social life. And this particular balance of work and public prayer we have three to four hours of public prayers, uh, adding personal prayer and, and etc. It's very particular and it has no meaning by itself and for itself. It has meaning in relation to the variety of vocations. It's like a sign, a prophetic sign, a recording that human life is called to be achieved in God, in God. The ultimate criteria is this love, which is achievement of human life. And it's the only reality that we experience in this life and that will remain in eternal life. The last point, and not least, is the role of dialogue. We spoke about a journey, a journey where we grow in this experience of welcoming God's revelation, God's communication of Himself, transforming human into divine capacity of knowledge and love. And we are all pilgrims on this journey. We try to anticipate the fulfillment of humanity which will be after death in the resurrected world where humanity will be a communion of difference, a communion uniting people from all races, cultures and religions in peace and justice. And dialogue takes place under this common horizon. It's a gift, a gift of God, in order to grow in the understanding of what we received in the revelation. Maybe the Christian church lives a little bit isolated in his in its uh, uh, citadel of truth for too long. And the last council of Vatican II opened the windows uh, and said very clearly that truth is not for itself and in itself, it's in relation. The identity of the church is to be in the world without being from the world. And in the encounter of 
the whole humanity, church is really church. Church is sign of this ultimate horizon. We are journeying towards it. And the commitment of the church to dialogue is the prolongation of God's initiative to enter into dialogue with humanity, which found in Jesus Christ its full human expression. And it's interesting to see how the Gospel portrays Jesus as a man of encounters, with an extraordinary freedom to recognize the Divine Spirit working in people he encountered. There is no uh, I mean, closure to uh, divine privilege or whatever. And the most beautiful uh, praising of faith by Jesus is addressed to a pagan Roman officer. He says, truly I tell you, in no one in Israel have I found such faith from a pagan one. Not, not a believer in the one true God. And the church receives from Jesus this confidence, this trust to enter into dialogue with all. The dialogue makes us encounter people who have other way to breathe, to breathe God. And this is an invitation to convert to God's ways, which are patience, gratuity, universality, when our tendency and our feel, fear make us uh, want to assimilate people to become from our own uh, herd and uh, religion or whatever. Dialogue often also is the occasion, the opportunity to recognize the harmonic notes between different faces. And finally, dialogue is in itself, and we, yesterday we heard this beautiful expression of dialogue, dialogue. It's an event of grace where God manifests himself in our poverty to welcome his, uh, his fullness of light and of love. And it makes dialogue not a prere prerequisite for something else. It's by itself an, in an event of grace, grace where both sides are converted to God, which is always greater. Yeah. Thank you very much.